everyone. I'm Isabel Pitt. Um, I am the current um, head of core services at Zopa Bank. Uh, my team's purpose is to create innovative and scalable solutions for all of our customer and product propositions. Um, for those of you that don't know about Zopa, um, Zopa started as a peer-to-peer -peer lending group in 2015 and we got our banking license two years ago and have just reached profitability. It's so cool. Um, so that's, that's been really exciting for us as a company and we're really striving, you know, in our purpose, we're a very purpose-driven company and we're really striving to be not like the other banks. We see ourselves as a fintech and we want to have the most happy customers in the market. So I think that's pretty exciting. That really aligns with some of my values. Um, what, how are we doing that? We're looking to do that through transparent and easy to understand lending and savings products at the moment and we're building them through a really diverse and talented group of people. So we're really proud of that diversity and inclusion that we have within the company. Right. So what are we here to talk about today? I'm really humbled to have your attention for the next 30 minutes to talk about something that I've been thinking about for quite some time. And that's, um, you know, it scares me and excites me in equal measures. <laughs> and that's around human bias, also known as cognitive bias in technology. I should start this talk with saying that I am not a professor, nor am I a psychologist, or do I do research full time. I'm just a leader in fintech, and I'm really worried about exclusion, like ex sorry, exclusion, and what I'm seeing as far as a divide in society at the moment through the acceleration of digital AI and machine learning. I'm really seeing that at the moment and I think it's a conversation that we have to have as leaders um, and be aware of in the decisions that we make. So my hope for today is that at the end of this talk, you'll share some of my worry and um, leave just really reflecting on how bias could be affecting you, the decisions you make, the teams that you build, and how and whether really you are you know, positively or negatively impacting um, society and, and our future society with the decisions that you're making in your companies today. So you will notice a QR code and some of the slides. So there's a slider running in the background. So please feel free to um, take some questions and I'll take them at the end of the presentation. Right. So if you're anything like me, and I would hazard to guess that you are because we are at a CIO summit, I am a self-proclaimed technology and innovation nerd. If there is anything new going on, I want to be a part of it. I want to test it. I want to play with it. I want to try it. I just love, love, love what technology is bringing to society and you know, what it can do for us, how it's helping us. I mean, we heard about you know, the innovation at the digital transformation panel earlier around what's happening in you know, health. And it just really excites me how technology is going to continue to grow us as a society and help us. Um, so you know, there's a lot of opportunity that it brings. But I also think there's a lot of challenges that we need to consider when looking at innovation and technology. So back in 2016, I was at the Akamai Edge conference in San Francisco, and I had the pleasure of hearing a professor talking about data and talking about how it could help you with your security landscape. And machine learning and AI really weren't spoken about at that time. And there was something that he said, and it's le sort of left with me since that presentation. And it's around, he, he basically likened machine learning and AI to the first industrial revolution. And I really walked away going, yes, this is not something to be scared of. This is something to be excited about. So ever since then, I've been really contemplating the human aspects of it and the human impacts and what society is going to look like because of it. And I find that whole aspect really interesting because, you know, looking at the first industrial revolution, you could see all the benefits and you can see how we changed as and we evolved as humanity. What's going to be the next evolution of us? So we are seeing, you know, and I think all of us can agree that COVID has really accelerated this. You know, people are much more aware of QR codes, they're much more aware of digital adoption, and they're much more inclined to accept it, which means we're seeing companies also adopt AI and machine learning as part of their digital strategies, not just this like lofty aspiration that, you know, they're thinking about for the future. Um, McKinsey recently re released a paper that said um, we've leapt, like COVID has actually leapt from us seven years with digital adoption. So we're actually seven years ahead of where we would have been had COVID not happened. So now let's get a little bit interactive. Um, raise your hands. Um, so how many biases do you think there are and that people are researching now as psychologists and anthropologists? Does, raise your hand if you think there's 10. 
Anybody? <laughs> there's 20, if there's more than 30, anybody? Okay. So there's actually over 50. So, you know, 50 different biases. And if you compound that with the number of people in the room, your life experiences, the things that have been handed down to you, you know, beliefs that have been handed down to you by your parents, the people that you've met, you know, th th it's limitless how much bias can actually creep into all the decisions and experiences that you have today. Whether you're aware of it or not, these are all actually driving your decision making, how you look at a problem and how you attempt to solve it. It still shocks me today when I meet people that are new, like in a session, like a setting like this or at a new work function and they go, oh my God, you're the first lesbian I've ever met. <laughs> and you're so normal. This is such a normal conversation. And I'm just, the first thing that hits me is, oh my God, we're so different. And you don't realize the bias you're actually carrying because you've said that to me. Um, and, and it's just really, really interesting. So because of the complexity of the number of biases that there are and just how much technology, I thought I would narrow it down because I've only got 30 minutes. Um, and I talk about confirmation and blind spot bias um, and how they relate to data and machine learning. So what is confirmation bias? Basically, it's when you're searching for something, whether it's a data point, evidence, something that actually affirms what you already believe or think. You're looking for that evidence to basically say, yep, I was right. And when you actually ask the data, you've already got that idea in your mind. So you're already predisposing how you're going to read the data. Some people might call it like a one-sided validation of hypothesis. I just call it real tunnel vision. Consciously or unconsciously, most people already have the question in their mind if they're asking the data. I had a really interesting chat last night um, with um, Stan, actually, who's here, just around bioengineering and just how they're not even asking a question from the data. And I thought, okay, here are a group of people who are trying to not even have a question to bring in that like, potential for confirmation bias in what they're asking. Because usually when you have a question, you already have a predisposed idea of what the answer is gonna be, so you're going to then look for the answer that affirms that. Um, and we all do it. It's just within our nature, we're human. That's what makes us really interesting. It can also be about how you word the question. So if you think about it, if you're a dog person, you're gonna go into Google and go, are dogs better than cats? And if you're a cat person, you're gonna go, are cats better than dogs? Um, and Google is going to, based on the machine engine and the learning that it's already done and the algorithms, it's gonna respond back weighted with the, with the words that you've already put first, right? So it's already got that weighting been built. So it's gonna respond with either dog pages or cat pages. So when we contemplate mitigations for this, we should really be contemplating um, responsive uh, representative data sets and how we build balanced response distribution. Because you know, we should be bringing back all the answers and allowing the human to make the decision for themselves rather than actually weighting it. So moving on to what I think is probably the most impactful and why I wanted to talk about it today with all of us is the blind spot bias because it requires an individual to be aware, introspective, um, ready and open to question their own ideas and beliefs <clears throat> and how they're actually making decisions and really implementing lasting change. Um, it's a really hard one to overcome. And basically blind spot bias is when you don't even know that you have a blind spot. You think, I'm good. You know, I'm really out there. I, you know, I'm not going to bring any blind spots in here. Um, you know, we're cool. I, you know, I'm, I'm good for this. And the reality is it's really impossible to not have a blind spot. It's the nature of who we are as humans. I honestly feel like this bias is probably the, the root cause of most product and technology failures. You know, you've, you've not bring, brought everybody into the room and you've basically assumed a decision on behalf of someone who's not there. So whether you've done, you know, you've done your research and you've, you know, done it in within the team and you've not gone external, you're not really getting that whole data set that's allowing you to make the strategy or the assumptions be based off real data that's broad enough for you to actually understand what it means. So you've basically made the decision on behalf of people. What gets really interesting is when blind spot bias is coupled with confirmation bias because then it gets really weird. So you're basically saying you don't have a bias. I'm not reading the data with a preconceived idea to the question that I've already determined. 
And I think, you know, in the past, I've actually had a few leaders that have been like this. <laughs> so now that we know what data is and what confirmation, sorry, what confirmation and blind spots are, I thought I would bring them to life with, with some not, what not to do. So let's start with Amazon. So back in 2018, um, this was in the news, bless Amazon. Obviously, they're hiring quite a bunch of people and they're trying to accelerate and automate their process. So they used an AI system in order to do that. What they didn't realize is that their team was so narrow and were using existing uh, hiring policies that were already gender skewed that they basically, instead of rectifying the problem, they just automated it and made it worse. So they basically, um, once they realized just how gender biased their automated hiring process was, they canned it. And to this day, none of the engineers that um, were actually working on it wanted to be identified. <laughs> so if that's not a blind spot bias in action, I really don't know what is. Um, Honestly, when I was doing some research for this, trying to get some you know, latest stories and, and reaffirming some of um, the hypotheses that I had on companies, there was so much to choose from, from Facebook, bless them. They really have a lot of, learn we can learn a lot from them. Um, so, you know, they've got, you know, instances of bias with chatbots, um, bias led um, misinformation, you know, data driven, like data policy breaches. But the one that I thought I would pull out that's around um, confirmation bias is the incident that they had in 2019 where they launched their advertising platform that was meant to be looking at marketing, finance products, um, housing, and they actually breached the, I mean, it was so biased and skewed and was replicating what was going on in US society at the time that they actually breached the constitution and they were sued by the Department of Housing because they were actually shown to have been um, detrimentally um, affecting people's access to housing through their advertising. You know, I mean, this is a big deal. People are losing out on housing, they're losing out on jobs, all because of the inability, um, the biases that are being brought into the equation. And the last one, the last bad apple, sorry, that was, <laughs> sorry for the pun, it was just too easy. Um, it, it was, you know, and Apple being guilty of a blind spot and confirmation bias, in my view, is around the launch of Apple Card. I mean, Apple Card had no idea that they were actually, you know, they had built themselves a sexist product. You know, they had launched a product with the help of Goldman Sachs into the marketplace that basically was giving um, better interest rates and approval rates to men over women. And they had the data to do to see that. And interestingly enough, all of the um, face, sorry, the Apple leadership said, well, we had a gender blind algorithm that was put into the database, but clearly not because the weighting of the approvals and the interest rates was actually skewed. Um, based on, I can see a question face. <laughs> um, basically, I think you have to look. You have to look at the weighting of it for male and female because it's not equal. You know, we know that there's a gender pay gap. We know that there are different scenarios for women. So you do actually have to look at them at gender and actually see how you want to weight them in order for them because it's not weighting apples for apples anymore. Like we have to look at it still apples for oranges and until we have that pay equality um, you know and, and access to opportunities we can't weight them in the same way so let's be frank the impacts of all of this it's, it's impacts to real people, right? You know, this is an example of people not getting jobs, not getting housing, and not getting um, access to fair finance. Um, they also demonstrate a, what I believe is an unnecessary divide in society that's being continually perpetuated by the technology that we're putting out. Right, so what? So why should we care? <laughs> um, personally, I feel it's my duty as a privileged woman um, to be able to stand here and talk to you about this, to challenge my own decisions and really think about the decisions I'm making and the teams that I'm building and what it's doing to create a fair landscape for all people. Um, as machines start to take on more menial tasks, the divide between the digitally enabled and the digitally non-enabled is getting wider. Ask yourself what's going to happen to these people who no longer have a job um, and who aren't digitally you know, able or enabled and don't have those digital tools. What's going to happen to them in our society? 
The latest research estimates that about 14% globally, people don't have access to digital skills or access to digital tools. And here in the UK, it's a whopping 22%. It's a nearly quarter of our UK population that doesn't have access to any of these tools or any of these skills. I was having a chat with Sesh um, last night um, from Sensidia, and we were, we were debating what was the driver of those. You know, is it the age population? Like, what, what is driving those factors? And I think, you know, given you know the rise and in increase in costs um, for people, is you know, is it your heat? Is it your food? Or is it your internet? that you're going to choose to pay your bills. And I do think as the increase in cost of living um, continues, I think people are going to have to make some hard choices which will potentially skew those numbers even further. Um, so we do need to be aware of it. And what can we do to support accessibility and people staying on that journey with us? So I think the examples that I gave hopefully have given some weight to my hypothesis that confirmation and blind spot bias um, in technology is already impacting people. Um, from financial inclusion to opportunities to, um, and it's making the divide even bigger. It's also my hypothesis that it's impacting businesses. Because let's face it, if we're not taking data analysis and the research to give us a broader data set, we're going to be making strategies on data that's actually not targeting our correct market segmentation. And we're effectively not going to see the return on investment that we expect. So it's the cyclical challenge that we have. And to put some kind of number on this, the World Bank currently estimates that the human capital loss from global gender equality only is $160 trillion. When you compound that with other biases and other inequalities, I daren't to think, I can't do the math to think of what that's going to be, but it's going to be exponential. So we're definitely, there are some strong figures to say that we need to take this seriously, and we're all responsible for that. So, I did say at the start of my session, I wanted you to share some of my worries, so I hope you are, um, but also some of my excitement. I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's all doom and gloom and that there's no hope for, um, for change, because there are. Um, I was excited to hear, um, Helen, you talking about earlier around digital transformation and human aspects of transformation, so I do feel like you've set me up quite nicely. <laughs> Um, Dr. Linda Hill, who is a professor at Harvard um, and who is, you know, really doing study and research around digital transformation and how organizations should be contemplating this, talks to the fact that there is, she believes, 80% of companies that are doing digital transformation actually should be doing a human transformation. So they should be looking at their people. The digital transformation is the tools that enable you. It's the people behind the tools that need to change. So I believe true change starts with all of us in this room. So what I think Dr. Hill wants us to ask, our, ask ourselves, and I hope you take away, is does our company reflect society? Like, are we standing next to a gamut of people that we would see on the street? And if not, how can we change that? Are you self-aware as a leader enough to um, challenge yourself in your thinking and say, why am I making this decision? Does your company have a culture of open questioning, or are you just accepting the data? You know, do you challenge the data? Do you challenge why we've come to this answer? What's driven that? Or are you just happy to go, OK, thanks for the analysis. I'll take that for your word, and I'm not going to question it. It's about the questioning that's going to get us to a better outcome. And also, do you test and learn? I mean, I know a lot of us have gone on a digital transformation, and we're all using agile principles. So we should be testing and learning. But what do you do with the learning? Do you then implement it and act? That's the next step, is to act on that. Um, a lot of research, recent papers um, on this topic talk to addressing uh, the harmful effects of AI bias and data bias through computational factors such as representative data sets and fairness of machine learning algorithms. And I think all of those are super necessary, but they go alongside the human journey that we need to take. Um, human bias, in my belief, is only going to be rectified by the humans that are identifying the problems and trying to solve them. So I personally think bias is impossible to fully mitigate, but I do think it's easier to interrupt. So I do want to leave you with some, some of my top tips for interrupting them. 
And I hope the easiest one is going to be around diverse hiring. I think having a diverse range of people in the room is hopefully going to mitigate the single-mindedness or that confirmation bias that you have or being able to bring in awareness about blind spots. Um, we all we know the figures, you know, racially diverse teams report a 35% increase in, in performance compared to teams that aren't racially diverse. I mean, that alone should be enough to want to, you know, instigate that kind of change. At Zopa Bank, we actually um, are always looking for new ways to partner. It's part of our, our board strategy. Um, and we look at companies like Code First Girls or Tech Up, where, <laughs> see some smiles, they're, they're brilliant, where you know, they're, they're looking for career change individuals who want to come in with a different point of view um, and start an engineering journey. And it's super exciting to support them and be able to find new and emerging talent that come out of those courses. Interestingly enough, these, these two organizations are seeing or are actually providing a 30% um, increase to UK universities of engineering and coding um, learning and development. So, I mean, they're really adding to this wave of new and emerging talent. Identi identifying parties or people that are not in the room. It's about being honest with your teams and saying, who isn't here? How do we gain access to their insight? And then partnering with research teams or others to enable you to get them into the room, that proverbial room. So partnering, again, and that's another partnering, you might not be able to affect the, what your team looks like, but being truly honest with yourselves and saying, who are we missing that we're building for? And actually trying to bring them into the room. Next would be setting concrete goals for fairness at the beginning. So again, to confirmation and blind spot, confirmation bias, you're halfway through, you're going to try, you know, you, you already know the answer. If you set these fairness rules and goals at the beginning, then you're going to be able, to, you're not going to skew them by what, you, what happens. Because we all know, you know, all of a sudden you're down the road of creating a project board get wind of it, somebody important gets wind of it, they want you to drive it home. But if you have these goals ahead of starting, you're able to use them as a barometer, even if you have the delivery pressures that come with the investment. Then design metrics and algorithms to be used to measure them. You know, are we, how are we going? You might not, you know, as a team, you might not be able to meet them, but at least you're measuring them and you're aware of the fact. And you can come back as part of your maturity and your product delivery to to iterate on that and get better as you go and the last one which i think really is the most important one for us and i spoke to it before is around testing learning and then acting on that the machine isn't going to change unless we actually implement the learnings that we have so we need to continually be educating the machines educating the data so that we actually have an opportunity to change the outcomes and I'd like to leave you with the words of Benjamin Haddon, um, who is a famous British painter and died in um, 1846. He did grand, like, historical paintings, so he was a big picture man. And he said, for serious minds, a bias recognized is a bias sterilized. And I do think that's true. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I hope you're worried <laughs> with me and excited as well. Um, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you.